Welcome. My name is Victor Lubinsky, and I'm grateful that you have joined me today to explore symbolism found in works of pedagogical composers. In my own writing, I've been interested for years in how music can symbolically represent extra musical concepts. Throughout the years, as I have performed and taught works by master composers who incorporated symbolism into their writing, I began to wonder if other pedagogical composers also did the same. This led me to undergo this preliminary study of symbolism used by contemporary pedagogical composers. My first step was to reach out to specific composers and publishers, asking them to identify their own piano works that use symbolism. I received a wonderful response and have many wonderful examples to share with you today. In compiling these works, I decided I'd focus on several categories of symbolism, all of which can be used to make the pieces programmatic, referring to something outside of music itself, like a scene, a person, or an emotion. First, quotation. Does a composer quote a pre-existing composition in any way? And is this quotation symbolic? Is it used because it relates to what the composer is trying to communicate? Second, pictorial writing. In song, we call this word painting. Popular with 16th century madrigalists and many composers following. In piano music, we obviously have no words, but composers can still create programmatic connections through pitch, harmony, rhythm, and other parameters of music. Third, cultural references. Sometimes music is depicting a certain culture, something that has become more controversial in recent years. We'll talk more about that later. Fourth, soggetto cavato, deriving a subject using letters from a name or place to create a musical theme. And then finally, we'll examine a few miscellaneous means of symbolic representation in music not covered by these other categories. So let's first look at quotation using musical material of a previously composed work. This may be quotation of melody only, quotation of multiple voices, or quotation of a progression or texture that reminds us of a previous work. I'd like to start our discussion of each type of symbolism by identifying how composers throughout the centuries have used each device. Then we will see how pedagogical composers incorporate this type of symbolism. Familiar melodies have been borrowed by composers since at least the early Renaissance. Two melodies come to mind. First is the Dies Irae chant, translated as Wrath of God, which has been used by countless composers. From Brahms in Opus 118, number six, To Sondheim in Sweeney Todd. A second melody used frequently by Renaissance composers is Lo Marme. Many composers wrote masses with this tune appearing as the tenor line of each movement. Not particularly symbolic in this use because the words of Lo Marme had nothing to do with the mass text, but still it helps us to trace the history of how composers have quoted other compositions. In Dufay's Misa Lo Marme, we see the Lo Marme melody in the tenor line, shown here in the red box. Robert Schumann was also known for quoting pre-existing works. In Papillon No. 12, he quotes the 17th century tune, The Grandfather Dance. The words could be translated as something like this, and the grandfather took the grandmother because the grandfather was a bridegroom. So even though there wasn't actually a marriage implied in the novel Flegeljara, on which Schumann based his Papillon, the symbolic use of this love theme helps us understand that there were two brothers, prototypes of Schumann's Eusebius and Florestan, vying for the affection of a young woman named Vina. 
Schumann also quoted from Beethoven's song cycle An die Ferne Geliebte in the first movement of his fantasy. The translation of these words, Accept then these songs I sang for you, beloved. Sing them again at evening to the lute's sweet sound. Surely these express Schumann's feelings toward his beloved Clara, whom he was hoping to marry. Here is one spot in the first movement of the fantasy where Schumann quoted this Beethoven theme. Some composers also quote multiple voices of a pre-existing composition. This may have started with the Renaissance parody mass, where more than one line was taken from another polyphonic work and then used in the mass, just changing the words and maybe adding additional lines. Like the Lomar main masses, this wasn't particularly symbolic, but helps us trace the history of quotation. Recent piano works using direct quotation of previous works include Crumb's dream sequence from Macrocosmos, we're hearing that in the background now, which quotes the B section of Chopin's Fantasy Impromptu. Ross Lee Finney's Narrative in Retrospect also quotes Chopin, this time the G minor blood, and then Rockberg's Nach Bach, which could be translated after Bach or following after Bach, quotes and paraphrases parts of Bach's Partita number no. six in E minor. The final type of quotation is borrowing a progression or texture from another composer in a manner that would be recognizable. Early examples include the Baroque stock melodic harmonic patterns used in multiple compositions and improvisations. We're hearing the Romanesca pattern now in the background. As for quotation of texture, I think we can identify Rockberg's intention to imitate Bach's texture in Nach Bach, even when he isn't using a direct quotation. Let's turn now to the works of pedagogical composers to see how they use quotation. Many of these examples show motives that are being taken from another melody without the complete melody being used. Here we can see how Melody Bober uses motives from the Irish folk song Killarney in her piece, Killarney's Jig. So in Killarney you have that, that's that first box and we hear that in melodies, the third measure shown. And then we have the opening of the song at the top. And Melody uses that in measure 13. So all together sounds something like this. Chris Golston uses motives from three pre-existing melodies in amber waves to symbolize Americana. So we start with Amazing Grace, and then we have a quote from America the Beautiful that elides into simple gifts. Later on, Chris uses multiple voices from a previous composition. His mom, Margaret Golston's piece, Song of the Birds. Note how the melody is similar to America the Beautiful. Here's Margaret's, uh, the part that he quotes. And here's Chris's quotation of that passage. Philip Kevrin helps us know which Johann he's talking about just by using this familiar progression. I 
decided to imitate the Chopin E minor prelude in this arrangement of Lord I Need You. My son, who quit piano in junior high, came home from college one summer and decided to learn this prelude on his own. And I tried to stay out of the way so I wouldn't mess him up. He wound up playing it beautifully and I was inspired to write a piece here expressing the longing I sense in the Chopin work as well. So use the ending of the Chopin. piece ends in major. One of my earlier Alfred publications was a Christmas suite of three carols called The Christmas Shepherds. I decided to incorporate motives from Handel's Messiah, the selections that dealt with shepherds. The pastoral symphony, think bah, sheep, right? Pastor means shepherd, is used in the, in the introduction of How Great Our Joy, the words which start while by my sheep. So I use the double thirds and the melodic motive from the pastoral symphony in this passage. And you can hear the pastoral symphony, the, the circled part there. Right. And I use that in my How Great Our Joy. The second movement of the suite, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, quotes he shall feed his flock from the Messiah. And in the third movement, the first Noel, the recitative from the Messiah, there were shepherds abiding in the field, is used as the introduction, thus unifying each movement musically with a Messiah quote and with the literary theme of shepherds. In my Four Corners suite, with one movement for each of the states forming the Four Corners region of our country, the Colorado piece is called Peering Over Pike's Peak. The poem America the Beautiful was written by Catherine Lee Bates after she visited Pikes Peak in 1893. So I felt obliged to insert motives from America the Beautiful into this piece. I'm not sure you would know they were there if I didn't point them out. And that's often true in my writing. So if I'm honored to have you or your students playing one of my pieces, please ask yourself, what about this piece would lead Victor to borrow something to insert? And you might just find one of my hidden motives. Here's an excerpt. So we have America the Beautiful with this. And here's those very intervals. With a different rhythm. In another more advanced arrangement of How Great Our Joy, the song we looked at in The Christmas Shepherds, I chose to incorporate a Gregorian chant, Quem Vidistis Pastores, Again, with the shepherd theme, whom have you seen shepherds, is how it's translated. And this helps to connect the theme of shepherds with the universally recognized body of Gregorian chant. So that the opening just repeats this as kind of a... Like an ostinato. So at the very end, we quote the entire 
chant as a coda. I'm going to come into it a couple measures before what you have. The hymn, Brethren We Have Met to Worship, is one of America's oldest. And I paired it with my piece, Pennsylvania Dutch Country, since this region is home to many Amish people, and I connected the early hymn with these early settlers. Did you hear it? The motive from that used there. My trio, A Walk Through the Valley, for piano, viola, and cello, was commissioned by MTNA for their intermediate chamber music program called From the Pen to the Premiere. It is one of the most symbolic pieces I've written, as you'll see throughout this whole presentation. Each movement represents one of three famous valleys in different parts of the world. The first movement is Urubamba, the valley below Machu Picchu in Peru and I decided to use the Peruvian national anthem with an altered metric pattern as a theme. In the second movement, Yosemite, we see the Dies Irae motive used in the cello to symbolize fear. I I'm deathly afraid of heights out in nature, so Yosemite does that to me. There's the Dies Irae, and we're going to hear this motive in the cello. Also, since William Tell was a legendary Swiss hero, I quote the famous theme from Rossini's William Tell Overture in the last movement, representing the Swiss Valley Lauterbrunnen. Valley de Obermann from Liszt's Years of Pilgrimage is about a mythical village in Switzerland and seemed an appropriate piece to quote here. I started to apologize for taking um, his haunting, brooding theme and turning it into a polka, but I realized that Liszt was a forerunner in using the technique of thematic transformation in his own works, so I decided that he might have transformed this into a polka if he were writing this piece too. I'm grateful for my student, Adam Gates, who performed Valley de Oberman, and we are hearing his performance in the background. Now let's listen to a little excerpt where this is quoted in my piece. My Wyoming landscape suite features a piece called Old Faithful, named for perhaps the most famous geyser in the world, or at least in the U.S., I thought it would be appropriate to quote another fountain piece and thought of Ravel's Jadot. With the intervals a little smaller to fit the intermediate hand. Rocherol uses the texture and seventh chord harmonies found in French composer Eric Satie's Genopédie No. 1 in this piece depicting a Parisian scene. So we have the sati, and we have the rosharol piece. Which seems to transport us straight to Paris, doesn't it? The second type of symbolic writing we're discussing today is pictorial writing. We might call it word painting for piano. Many classical composers have used this technique and pedagogical composers have also adopted pictorial writing in their works. Pictorial writing includes 
creating the scene of a programmatic work using some kind of musical means. For example, imitating church bells through the intervals in tessitura, uh, writing uh, a high or ascending line for heaven or mountain, or writing a low or descending theme for a valley or low area. Schubert used the spinning wheel motives in the piano accompaniment for his lead, Gretchen am Spinrada, Gretchen at the spinning wheel. The right hand has a circular spinning pattern, while the left hand is imitating the rhythm of the treadle, the pedal that keeps the wheel going. Another great example of a pictorial writing is the way Mazorsky imitates baby chicks in his Ballet of the Unhatched Chicks. Moving now to pedagogical composers, Dennis Alexander musically depicts the story of Pope leading the Pueblo people of New Mexico in a revolt against the Spanish. The piece opens with a warlike march. And then it moves on into a frantic battle-like section. Tom Giroux, in his sonata titled Circe Invidiosa, creates an opening motive to represent swirling waters. English painter John William Waterhouse completed his Circe Invidiosa in 1892. Tom seeks to capture the essence of this painting in his one movement programmatic sonata, much in the same way that Mazorsky was trying to depict the paintings of Victor Hartman in pictures at an exhibition. Tom writes this in his program notes. The coda, a sequence of descending gestures marked crescendo e accelerando poco a poco, represents the pouring of emotion from Circe's cup down to the ferocious transformation her feet. Tom also does a great job of depicting a scene in Attack of the White Grizzly. First, we hear the person running from the bear in the opening measures, and then we hear the person scampering up a tree to escape the bear's pursuit. At the end, we hear the outsmarted bear snarling at the base of the tree. Let's imagine, shall we, that bears can't climb. Uh-oh. Rain, depicted by so many composers, is heard at the beginning of Tom's Autumn Rain. Continuing on in Tom's piece, we hear first a faster rainfall. Followed by a heavy downpour. Joyce Grill, like 20th century French composer Messiaen, effectively imitates birdsong. See what intervals you hear in this recording of the loon. Joyce has transcribed the sound as a rising fourth. Joyce also tries to capture another sound from nature, leaves rustling in golden aspens. <laughs> Philip finds inspiration also in tree leaves, though this time depicting falling leaves through the descending melodic lines.
I had fun trying to depict a nature scene in my second Old Faithful composition. At the beginning, you hear the bubbling up as Old Faithful begins to erupt. Next is the rising figure of the eruption, followed by the falling water in the descending passage. The B section represents the long time period of waiting between eruptions. Did you know that Old Faithful only erupts about 17 times per day? The original title I had proposed for Wildlife in the Valleys, the final movement of my adventures in Yellowstone, was Bison and wolves and bears, oh my. Well, at the beginning, we're introduced to the howling wolves. Next come the lumbering bears. followed by the stampeding bison. On a more serious note, the African-American spiritual Steal Away is in a collection about heaven, and it seems to speak of going to heaven on one level. I try to create the sound of the angelic trumpet as the song lyrics read, the trumpet sounds within my soul. The ending paints the soul rising to heaven, becoming distance farther and farther from its earthly dwelling. Looking again at my chamber piece for piano, viola, and cello, the suite opens with a descent into the first valley. While the final movement ends with an ascent out of the valley. My fear of heights is depicted in the Yosemite movement, not only with the quotation we saw earlier of the Dies Irae theme, but also pictorially through dissonance and a high tessitura for the strings, perhaps inciting a little performance anxiety as these intermediate players have to negotiate these higher notes. The final movement featuring the Swiss Valley Lauterbrunnen, opens with my depiction of the church bells we heard outside our hotel window. Kevin Olson, like Joyce Grill, was also inspired to imitate birdsong, here specifically the meadowlark. I love Robert Vandal's use of an extended technique to create ghost sounds in this piece. By silently depressing keys on the piano, the overtones from the left hand notes ring in these open strings, creating the ghostly sounds.
Isn't that cool? We now move on to the next category of symbolic writing, cultural references. This is not hard to find in our master composers. Debussy, in two of the three pieces of Estampe, takes us first to Japan in Pagod, and then to the Spanish city of Granada. Debussy makes more controversial cultural references in some of his depictions of music from the U.S., including Minstrels, a depiction of the American minstrel show featuring white actors in blackface. In 1986, Anne McKinley wrote an article, Debussy and American Minstrelsy, in the journal The Black Perspective in Music, where she discusses the controversy in Debussy's piece. In my piano literature class at Point Loma Nazarene University this past spring, I asked students to write about whether they thought another Debussy controversial piece should be performed today and receive thoughtful responses across the spectrum. These are questions arising out of racial inequities and perceptions that many of us have become more painfully aware of this past year. So as we consider pieces with cultural references, we may want to make ourselves aware of the concept of cultural appropriation, defined as the unacknowledged or inappropriate adoption of the customs, practices, or ideas of one people or society by members of another, and typically more dominant people or society. After doing this research, we can then thoughtfully and conscientiously make decisions about performing and teaching literature featuring other cultures. I had an Asian student perform and do a piano literature class presentation on Debussy's Pagode. His personal conclusion was that Debussy had done quite a bit of research on Asian music and was trying to honor the music and the culture. Thus, the student felt that the piece was entirely appropriate for him to perform. Let's all continue to think deeply on this matter as we become sensitive to our neighbors and friends whose experiences are different from ours. I mentioned Hinastera as well. His first sonata leaned into Argentine culture, including the gaucho music of the Pampas region. In his second sonata, he expanded his exploration of style by trying to incorporate musical elements of Argentine indigenous people. I believe he also did this out of admiration and respect for these people groups. I welcome learning from you on these issues as well. Discussing cultural references in pedagogical works, let's first look at Pulpe's Rebellion by Dennis Alexander. First, a little context for this piece. Dennis lives in New Mexico and wrote this piece to commemorate a revolt in the year 1680 by the Pueblo people against their Spanish oppressors. Dennis uses pentatonicism found in many world areas, and this might seem to be a stock device for representing native music. However, I listened to a few recordings of Pueblo people singing Pueblo music, and I did hear the exclusive use of the traditional pentatonic scale. Here's Dennis's piece. Bober uses characteristics of Irish music in her Wexford reunion. First, we see grace notes and ornaments, which are stylistically Celtic. We also find the use of bass fifths, another Celtic style characteristic. The Scotch snap, a Celtic rhythm, can be found in measure 19, where we have this short, long rhythm. The compound meter is that of the Irish jig. Think box sweet final movements, jig, the French name for jig. In my Grand Canyon Fiesta, I use Latin rhythms, notably a cha-cha rhythm in measure one, and then a tango rhythm in measure seven. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So here's the whole thing. All 
Also in Grand Canyon Fiesta, we find a frequently used Spanish progression, sometimes called the Andalusian cadence. It can be heard as one, flat seven, major six, and five in A minor, or as written here, minor four, major three, major flat two, and major tonic in E Phrygian with the normally minor tonic chord here heard as major, a borrowed chord like a Picardy third. In my chamber trio that we have looked at already, I imitate a couple of instruments used by indigenous people in South America. First is the cana, a wooden flute. Ginastera also imitates the cana in his second piano sonata. I also imitate the charanga, a ukulele-like instrument. You can hear the charanga accompanying the cana in the recording playing in the background. I imitate the cana at the very beginning of the piece. Later on, the viola and then cello strum to imitate the charanga. I ask the violist to hold the instrument like a ukulele and strum it. We also studied interval content used in Andean music. We find frequent use of double thirds, but this may actually be an influence of Spanish music. Another frequent intervalic usage in Andean music is the tendency to end phrases with a descending minor third in the melody, something you can hear in my Urubamba piece. In the final movement, I looked for Swiss musical characteristics. First, I imitate alp horns. This is a picture of a few lying out in the grass that we saw during our visit to Lauterbrunnen. I hope you can imagine hearing these alp horns in this passage in my piece. The polka is also performed in Switzerland. Here is that transformed list theme that we saw earlier turned into this musical symbol of Switzerland, the polka. Yodeling is a characteristic vocal technique used in Swiss singing. In my Lauterbrunnen movement, I also have all three instruments attempting to yodel. First the piano, then the cello, and finally the viola. In the Golden Pavilion, Chrissy Ricker seeks to depict a particular scene, a Buddhist temple in Kyoto, Japan. She creates this effect by using the traditional pentatonic scale, perhaps most similar to the Japanese Yo scale. It is interesting to note that there are a number of Japanese scales that one might choose when writing a piece. I had a composition student a few years back who wrote a set of pieces on the different styles of bonsai trees. He researched the various Japanese scales and chose one for each bonsai style. Let's explore our next means of creating symbolic reference in musical composition. Soggetto Cavatto seems to have started with Italian Renaissance composers honoring patrons by spelling their names in compositions with musical pitches. In this slide, you can see the chart I've used to convert letters into pitches. And the second chart on the right is for converting numbers into pitches, both diatonic and chromatic. Bach spelled his own name in a few of his compositions, including the Contrapunctus number no. four from Art of the Fugue. Remember B equals B flat for German composers. B natural is represented by the letter H. So in that tenor line, and notice that that's written in a C clef, we start with B flat, we have the A, C, and then the H, B natural. Other composers, including Schumann, Liszt, Brahms, Schoenberg, and Webern have used this Bach motive. At the bottom of the slide, we see the transposed Bach motive being used in Italian composer Dalla Piccola's highly symbolic work, Quaderno Musicale di Anna Libera, musical notebook for Anna Libera, his daughter. This title is even 
making reference to Bach, his Anna Magdalena notebook. Schumann honored a non-existent Countess von Abegg in his Opus One. He had met a real life pianist named Abegg not too long before the composition of this, his Opus One. We see the opening right hand notes spell the name A, B flat, E, G, G. Schumann also used the letters A, S, C, H, A, lowercase s, A flat, C, H, and S, C, H, A in Carnival. A, S, C, H is the town, Ash, where his fiance at the time, Ernestine von Fricken, was born. And then S, C, H, A was short for Schumann. Let me show you the A, S, C, H in Carnival. A, S, C, H. Instead of using letters, I formed a theme using the number pi to symbolize Pike's peak in this movement for my four corner suite. Using diatonic numbering, I spell pi like this. We have 3.14159156341. Sounds like this. In my arrangement of this African-American spiritual, I do some name spelling to go along with the lyrics, were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Since Joseph of Arimathea was the man who provided the tomb for Jesus, I tried spelling his name with musical letters and solfege symbols to create a theme. So we have A, Do, Re, D, Re is D sharp, spelled here as E flat, Mi, Me, Ma, so E double flat, T, B, but this is K, B flat, and then A again. In my advanced sacred collection, Great Things He Has Done, I began this medley with the collection title and spell great, G, Ray, E, A, and then T in movable do, we're in the key of D, so that's T do. And then grace, G, Ray, A, C, C sharp in this key, and then E. Seattle Summits from my sweet, wonderful Washington, I spell the city name using soulfish syllables and letters. We have E flat, S, spelled D sharp in this key, and A, and then T, B natural, and then Le, which would be La, Le, A flat, but in this spelling it's G sharp. visit this chamber piece and find that the title itself is symbolic. A walk through the valley finds its origin in Psalm 23 from the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. There is a 2-3 to stand for 23, 2-3 motive. Here a trill motive on scale degrees 2 and 3. That's used in every single movement. Since I've taken some time to show you how names are spelled in the previous examples. I'll just point out a few in a walk through the valley. My wife's best friend from childhood married a man with the last name Garmin. His parents had been Christian missionaries in Peru. So I spelled their name with musical letters in the Peruvian movement, Urubamba. <laughs> Thank you.
My cousin, Tobin Sorensen, was a professional mountain climber and was a member of a climbing group known as the Stone Masters, based in Idlewild. They also climbed extensively in Yosemite. Tragically, my cousin lost his life on an attempted first solo climb of a new route of Mount Alberta in Canada. The Yosemite movement begins with a T. Sorensen motive in memory of Tobin. Since John Muir was an early explorer and helped to establish Yosemite as a national park, I included him too. My son, who has become an accomplished rock climber, serves in this piece as my anchor in my fear of heights. So as the strings climb to their height, and perhaps it's a pretty scary tessitura for them, Christopher anchors everything in the base for me. I also spelled my wife and daughter's names in the piece as well. At the end of the entire suite, the musical ascent out of the valley spells the name of a long time family friend, Beryl, who passed away actually while Judy and I were in Lauterbrunnen. And we were ascending in this tram up from Lauterbrunnen Valley into the heavenly snow clouds above. It was so beautiful. And only, we found out later that Beryl had passed away just at that moment. So this final ascent out of the valley here represents Beryl going up into heaven. Wynne Ann Rossi also used this technique in her piece, Lilacs, where she spelled out the name of this tidal flower. Let's close by pointing out just a few miscellaneous symbolic gestures a composer might use. First, a composer may use key or pitch to create symbolic meaning. Schubert moved from a tonal center of D minor to F major in his song, Gretchen am Spinrada, when Gretchen begins talking about her love for Faust, F for Faust. And at the beginning of Wagner's ring cycle, the basses begin on a low E flat, a half step below their lowest string, which requires retuning in order to symbolize being underwater lower than the range of the instrument. In Tom Giroux's You and I, he uses various textures to indicate differing points of view. The opening chorale section is the first opinion. The second opinion is stated. At the end, we hear a melding of opinions with the flowing melody melding into the final chorale like chords. My reflections on Were You There, the hardware used in the extended techniques is symbolic. A spike is laid across the keys, symbolizing Christ being nailed to the cross. The ruler is later used to represent Christ as ruler of all and is used for the lyrics, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. <laughs> Let's close with two examples of the rhythm of spoken words. So for example, the spoken rhythm of Walla Walla is used as a rhythmic motive in my piece, Walla Walla Sweets. You see Walla Walla, Walla Walla, Walla Walla, three times in a row, starting at measure five. Likewise, Kevin Olson takes the rhythm one would use to say the title Rhythm of the Rain and uses it as a motivic rhythm for this piece.
thank you for investing your time today in learning about how pedagogical composers use symbolism in their writing. If you compose or teach composition, I hope that you have some new ideas and maybe can explore symbolism in your own works as well.